call this meeting to order this evening, March 18th, 2019. Mr. Calavita, may I have a roll call, please? Mr. DiDonato. Present. Ms. Linthorst. Here. Uh, Ms. Murray. Here. Ms. O'Reilly. Here. Ms. Pallara. Here. Mr. Sawicki. Here. Ms. Tracy. Here. Mr. Markulak, is he there? He's got to take him off mute. Mr. Markulak? Not there yet. We do have a quorum, but Mr. Markelek may join uh, during the meeting. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interests is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of the Act, the Hopewell Valley Regional Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof communicated to the Hopewell Valley News. The Times and the Trentonian on January 8, 2019. This meeting notice was also sent to Comcast Cable and Verizon Fios. The board reserves the right to enter into executive session during all meetings of the Board of Education. The meeting is being videotaped for the purpose of board review, future reference, preparation of the minutes, and viewing on Comcast Channel 19, Verizon Fios Channel 32, and the school district website www.hvrsd.org. Maybe. <laughs> Can we all rise for the flag salute? I'm not going to forget. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would somebody like to make a motion, please, to approve the minutes of 2 4 19, our work session, and the 2 11 19 regular meeting? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstained? <coughs> motion carries. First up, Shabani, would you like to make your presentation, please? Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, starting off with past events. The HVCHI's production of Chicago was held at the PAC for the first two weekends of March. The cheerleading team performed at the NCDCA state cheer competition on February 16th. The wrestling team had a great victory at their district tournament on February 16th. And the boys basketball team had their MCT semifinal game with the close score against Trenton Central at the Cure, Cure Arena. On February 21st, CHS welcomes students to a new main entrance, main office, and cafeteria, and the newly constructed main entrance uh, ensures stronger security measures are being taken. The CHS students competed uh, in the Consumer Bowl on February 22nd, and members of the CHS Unified Club and HVRSD staff participated in the Polar Bear Plunge on February 23rd, and they raised over $8,500 for Special Olympics New Jersey. On February 25th, high school students experienced a thought-provoking presentation from Dr. Byron Hurt and a debriefing session from Dr. Therese uh, to spark conversation about creating a more inclusive environment in school. On this day, students watched a portion of Dr. Hurt's award-winning documentary and participated in discussions about speech. Uh, Hopa Valley's Mary Kwok won the state girls diving title to score 68.5 on her final dive. Uh, members of the boys and girls basketball <coughs> were recognized at the CBC banquet on March 3rd. The DECA state conference was held at Atlantic City from March 4th to 6th in which Eric Goldberg and Matthew Lindhorst qualified for the international conference held in Orlando, Florida. Uh, the CHS St. Baldrick's team, led by Priya Nafade, Daphne Newton, and Haley Ad Adonizo, raised over $3,000 for childhood cancer research. Uh, HV Football's captain, Stephen Doldy, became the 2019 recipient of the Delaware Valley chapter of the National Football Foundation Scholar Leader Athlete Award. Uh, and on March 12th, the, the Science Olympiad team placed 
six overall at their regional tournament, winning prizes in anatomy and physiology, astronomy, disease detectives, and ecology. The team also qualified for their state tournament for the second time in their four-year competition history. And last Friday, uh, the all-night volleyball tournament at the high school was held with 27 teams of 10 competing for six hours straight. Uh, and student council held their annual spelling bee for the elementary schools uh, this past Saturday, March 16th at the PAC. Uh, for upcoming events, the spring pep rally will be held the last Friday before spring break and an e-cigarette presentation for the community will be held at 7 p.m. Uh, Thursday night before the pep rally. And there will also be a separate assembly for ninth and 10th graders. Uh, finally, some, I'm just going to highlight some student projects that are uh, coming up. So there are focus groups created for students based on ethnicity, race, religion, et cetera, and those will be starting soon. And also, Ms. Smith has created a large group of students um, spanning um, many different identities, and they have started meeting to discuss Hopewell's culture and topics that affect the school. So we continue to have um, more meetings with this group. And finally, there is a new student recognition project, uh, Dog Park, uh, which will be introduced soon. Uh, and this is an opportunity for students and faculty to nominate each other to recognize random acts of kindness or leadership in the HV school community. And the prizes range from winning free seats at sports games, having a VIP parking spot next to the principal, and potentially Mr. Brattel serving a meal to the winners. So it's always fun. <laughs> That's about it. Thank you, Shabani. Boy, yeah, what an impressive, um, impressive month we've had with yeah. our students. <laughs> really cool. Thank you so much. Anybody have any comments or questions for Shivani? Okay. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I just want to take this moment to um, welcome all of you this evening. Um, our recognition um, awards night for our teachers. Um, Teachers of the Year, and we're really excited to have you here. It's always a very um, fun, and um, it really just highlights the, the best things about our district. So thank you so much, and congratulations to each and every one of you, and thank you to the families for coming to support them. Um, I'm going to pass this on to Dr. Smith. We have a lot to cover today. Um, so thank you very much. Um, before we go on to the recognition of uh, educational professionals this evening, I'd like to welcome you all to stay for the Violence and Vandalism Annual Hearing and the Budget Review. They're really captivating uh, presentations, so don't feel obligated to leave. You can hang out for as long as you, as you like. Um, on behalf of the board and administration, I congratulate the teachers and service professionals here this evening on the significant accomplishment in your career in education. Today is a wonderful celebration of public education. I speak sin with sincerity when I say that Hopewell Valley Schools are the best in the state, if not the nation. And as a result, your honor as educators of the year should hold an even higher significance. You've been recognized by your school communities as someone who has exhibited outstanding performance, and you and your family should be very proud. Your work provides an incentive for others to strive for, but more importantly, you make a difference in the lives of children, and I thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Suzo, who is going to take the podium and going to review how we pick the educators and service professionals of the year. And we're going to ask you, when you come up, you'll get a small certificate and an award. You shake the hands with the, um, the board members, and then you are welcome to sit and stay for the budget presentation, um, if you would like. Thank you, Dr. Smith. As was mentioned, this truly is one of the highlights of the year for our district and our Board of Education. Each year, the Governor's Educator of the Year program honors teachers and educational service professionals throughout the state whose contributions to their students are exceptional. Staff members were nominated by their peers, parents, and students. A committee from each of our six schools, consisting of an administrator, staff members, and a parent representative, used the following criteria to select the recipient. Exceptional instructional techniques, superior ability to inspire students of all backgrounds and abilities to learn, respect and admiration of students, parents, and colleagues, 
ability to foster excellence in education as evidenced by ongoing contributions to the improvement of student achievement and the overall learning environment. Each of our honorees this evening will be recognized by the Hopewell Valley Education Foundation on Friday, May 10th at their annual Above and Beyond Gala, Boots and Bling. And they will also have an opportunity to attend a luncheon at the county level in May with Dr. Smith and President Murray. At this time, I will invite our building principals to come up and introduce their educator of the year. I would ask our honorees to please come forward after they are inter introduced and be congratulated by each of our board members as well as receive a certificate and flowers. We'll start off first with Hope Elementary, Principal David Frederick. Thank you, Mr. Suzo. President Murray, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Smith, members of HVEA, and community members. Congratulations to all of the Governor's Teacher Award recipients this year. Ms. Angelis, Ms. Sebastian, Ms. Cariola, Ms. Sell, Ms. Fertuccio, and of course, Mrs. Corvaline. Mrs. Helen Corvaline received a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Policy from Marist College and her Earth Systems Field School Certificate from Columbia University. She's currently enrolled in a Global Fields Program to earn her Master's in Conservation Biology from Miami University of Ohio. Mrs. Corvaline joined our community and a member of our staff in September of 2014. Since then, she has taught fifth grade science and social studies. Currently, she is our STEM facilitator, supporting and inspiring our preschool through grade five students, staff, in the sky. The following words were described by students, parents, and colleagues about what Mrs. Corvaline means to them. I was immediately impressed with her outgoing personality and her glowing attitude about her role in the school. In a short span of time, this teacher has made quite an impression on my daughter. Mrs. Corvaline is a wonderful resource for our school. She has spent a great deal of time creating a teacher-friendly, purposeful STEM curriculum. Students love having her assist in the classroom. This year, HES received nearly 30 nominating letters in all-time high. And it brings me great joy to announce Mrs. Corvaline, someone who truly transforms lives as Hopa Elementary School's recipient of the Governor's Teacher Award. Congratulations, Mrs. Corvaline. Next, from Stony Brook Elementary School, Steve Wilfing. Sorry about that, I was stalling for applause. <clears throat> Good evening. <laughs> oh, smattering, nice, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suzo. Good evening, Dr. Smith and Board of Education members and members of the Hopewell Valley community. I'd like to extend a thank you to all of our dedicated staff members across the district for their tireless effort throughout the school year. Uh, to each of the Governor's Education Recognition Awardees, my most sincere congratulations. The award winner from Stony Brook is a graduate of Drew University has bachelor's in psychology, and from there moved on to Fordham University and earned a Master of Arts in Education. 
She arrived in Hopo Valley in September of 2002, another of Dr. Fitzpatrick's brilliant staffing moves when Stony Brook opened. Lynn Angeles, over that time, has offered support in reading and literacy to hundreds of students. Her knowledge and understanding of the art of teaching reading is second to none. She delivers targeted intervention and instruction to meet students where they are, and her results have been outstanding. Uh, very wisely, I've chosen just mainly to leave her with reading. Uh, I've asked her to do some math. That didn't work out so good, but we're continuing on with the reading. So uh, thank you, Lynn, for all of your flexibility and your hard work for our students. She's a tremendous asset to our school and to our school district. Not only is she a wonderful educator, more importantly, she's an outstanding human being, terrific colleague, and a dear friend. Here are some things that uh, some of the nomination letters came in uh, said. <clears throat> she makes connections with all of her students and gives them all her attention and care. Lynn Angelus puts the E in the word efficient. Lynn is humble and giving with her effort to support staff and students. And man, is she good. She has shown her dedication and support to the Stony Brook community for many years. She is one of a kind. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present to you the recipient of the Governor's Teacher Recognition Award from Stony Brook Elementary, Mrs. Lynn Angelus. From Bear Tavern Elementary School, Chris Turnbull. Good evening, Board President Murray, Murray, Dr. Smith, Board of Education members and community members. And of course, congratulations to all of our recipients this evening. I'd like to thank you for all the hard work you do that led you to this point, because what you do every day matters a great deal. And it's a very important job. And for you to have done it at the level that puts you in these chairs tonight is really special. And it's very much appreciated. And I have the great fortune to be talking about a specific teacher tonight, Mrs. Christina Vertuccio, who started at Bear Tavern 20 years ago. And little did she know at the time if I was to ask her, I was at the school 20 years ago. I was as a sophomore in uh, Trenton State College, or just became a junior and running around in the junior practicum experience. And she was a student teacher. And you could tell 20 years ago how good she was and how poised she was. And of course, she never left Bear Tavern because once she student taught, they kept her there. But she's become a leader among our staff and has been for a while, but is a really active leader and makes us think about, as I prepared to talk about her tonight, made, us, made me think about how important and how complicated being a teacher is because she is incredibly knowledgeable and passionate about contemporary young adult fiction. And if I was to come up and ask her about any novel that a, a middle, fifth grade to uh, eighth grade level, she would know it cold and probably be able to quote it. That alone doesn't make you a great teacher, but it's pretty important. When you add to it her knowledge of writing conventions, of instructional techniques, of reading, it makes her even better. But then when you add how well she knows her students, and what makes them tick, and what motivates them, and what their families are like, and what they need, and when they walk through the door, what they did on the weekend, and how that's gonna relate to a book that they might want to read. She makes students love reading who didn't used to love reading, and she makes students believe that they can do anything, because she has the courage to try new things and to be flexible. And I remember very distinctly, quick show of hands, how many people have heard of Reverend Caldwell in our community? So he's a, uh, gentleman who you know has come to speak at our school a few times and it turns out that he's a was a friend of Martin Luther King and through his time working in social justice it you know he, he blurted out one anecdote among many though that 
60 years ago or 61 years ago now, he was denied his honeymoon because of the color of his skin. And he went all the way out to the Poconos to the Mount Airy Lodge and made the uh, reservation over the phone. And when he got there, they, they said, simply said, you can't stay here. So he stayed at a hunting lodge for his honeymoon. So he told the story, and it was, you know, again, among many stories that he told, and a few of us just scratched our chins a little bit, and the, the kids were pretty affected by it. And the next day, I have a teacher in my office saying, I have, an, I have an idea. The kids were talking about it, and they really want to do something. And that's great, and that's a good beginning. But then she pulls out a folder and says, you know, if we move the persuasive unit and flip-flop it with the poetry unit and change a few things around, I think the kids can do this. And then a few steps later... She's on national television, and our students are, um, you know, doing one of the most profound things that I have ever seen. And the important thing was that she was never leading from out front. She got behind the students, supported them, and let them know what they needed to do, and, and just guided them on the journey. So it was, it was an incredible thing for me to witness, but it shows the type of teacher, the type of leader that she is. And it's not just me who sees it because she had the trifecta of uh, nominations. She did have students nominator, she had teachers nominator and colleagues, and she had parents nominator. One student wrote, Mrs. Vertuccio is an inspiration. She hooks us with writing pieces that encourage student interest. Of course, I did double check it and check the student's identification to make sure that really was a student, and it did pan out. I know the student very well, but it was very articulate. Probably learned it in Mrs. Vertuccio's class. But then we had a colleague, though, and this is powerful because she said it, it's a common occurrence for students to come up to Christina in the hallway excited about reading. She not only has a strong rapport with her students, but also possesses such a great knowledge of books that she's able to find a book to engage every fifth grader. And again, to sit and watch Christina interact with the students that she teaches and do the things that she does every single day, it's humbling for me and it motivates me. So I'd like to congratulate Mrs. Christina Vertuccio. From Tollgate Grammar School, Jane Ellen Lennon. Good evening, President Murray, members of the board, Dr. Smith, all of my colleagues, and I congratulate the Special Teachers of the Year. It's a wonderful honor, and you'll enjoy the spring so much. It is my pleasure to announce Nicole Sebastian as our Governor's Teacher of the Year Award. Ms. Sebastian graduated from High Point University in High Point, North Carolina with a degree in special education and a minor in studio art. We're not telling anybody that. And a master's in special education. She came to Hopewell Valley in 2014 and began her teaching career um, with special education at Central High School in two sec. 2016, she came to Tollgate, and for the last two years, she has been a K-2 special education teacher, and she works with some of the best students in the entire district. Ms. Sebastian's dedication and commitment to her students exemplify an outstanding educator. She goes above and beyond to support her students and ensure their success at Tollgate. Some of the nominations said this about Ms. Sebastian. She is a leader who has created a classroom community that truly feels like a family. She understands the uniqueness of each of her students. She sees what many would describe as challenges and instead sees them as superpowers. Ms. Sebastian's impact to date will be felt throughout the community for years to come at the student, family, school, and district level. She possesses an exceptional commitment to the students and families of Hopewell Valley. She is the highlight of our day. Each morning and afternoon, I go into that classroom and there is magic happening. So thank you. Please welcome me, congratulating Ms. Sebastian as Tollgate's Teacher of the Year.
from Timberlane Middle School, Nicole G. and Freddie. Good evening, Dr. Smith, President Murray, members of the Board of Education. Um, I just would like to take a moment to thank our teachers for their dedication to our Hopewell Valley students every single day. Um, we all appreciate your continued support of our kids. And take a moment to congratulate all of our educators and support professionals of the year. It is my honor and privilege to present Timberlane's Governor Teacher of the Year, Mrs. Donna Cariola. Donna joined Hopewell Valley in 1990, and since then, she has taught in every building in this district, making Timberlane her home since 2005. Donna has an ability to connect with middle schoolers, helping each one find their inner artist. The teacher-student relationship is evident in the classroom, as she has made it a safe space for inner creativity and imagination to shine through. As one of her many nominations stated, for Donna, Teaching is more than just a job. It is a passion that radiates and touches everyone who comes in contact with her. Dedication to her job does not end when the bell rings. As one former student said, Mrs. Cariola is one of the nicest teachers I've ever had. She is caring, has a great sense of humor, and is always smiling. She knows when I'm having a good day and knows when I'm having a bad day, and then she always makes sure that I'm okay. She shows us that she genuinely cares about us and the students care about her too. If you've ever walked through our main lobby, you've seen the amazing products of Mrs. Cariola's instruction. If one were to pause at the first classroom they encounter walking into Timberlane and peer inside, they would observe Donna's students smiling, working diligently, listening to music, relaxing and enjoying themselves as they create. Her room is a respite from technology, an opportunity for kids to create art where they are limited only by their imaginations. And personally, myself, I've been known to seek respite from this crazy world and spend some time in Donna's classroom. Simply stated, Donna is a loyal colleague and a friend that is respected by all. She cares deeply about her students. I'd like to congratulate Mrs. Donna Cariola. From Central High School, Tana Smith. <laughs> oh, that Mr. Turnbull so funny. Good evening, Dr. Smith, President Murray, members of the board, and all of our community and family members for, for being here this evening. Congratulations to all of our honorees, and thank you for the incredible work you do each and every day with our students in the Valley. Um, I've had the distinct privilege of knowing this year's CHS Governor's Educator of the Year for almost 20 years. Lauren Sell and I started our teaching careers at Lawrence High School, working together in the math department and adjacent to each other in our classroom trailer. In 2005, I came to Hopewell Valley and knew Lauren would be a perfect fit for the high school math department. Ms. Sell began her career at Central High School later that fall and since then has taught a multitude of classes ranging from calculus, geometry, Math Lab and Pre-Calc Honors, just to name a few. She served as the advisor for the National Honor Society for several years. She is known as an extremely dedicated teacher who is knowledgeable and friendly and goes above and beyond to assist students and staff alike in any way she can. She is what you would call an early riser. Um, <laughs> she often gets to work uh, by six. I think she often beats Dave to work in the mornings, our head custodian. Um, but that time is well spent. She's prepping her lessons, and more than not, she's meeting with students. Um, she is, has a loving and supportive family and has a true gift when it comes to connecting with her students. Uh, some of the comments made by those who nominated her um, explain it all. It's not uncommon to walk into Lauren's classroom well before the school day begins and find her working with more than one student who has come in for extra help. I would consider Ms. Sell a master teacher because she is just as effective working with honors level students as she is with students who struggle with math. Students know she is on their side and willing to go above and beyond to make sure they succeed. She has a lasting impact on the students she teaches. 
We are so fortunate to have her at Central High School. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Lauren Sell on this well-deserved honor. We are also honoring this evening three support staff professionals from Hopewell Valley for their hard work and dedication to the district. Eligible candidates included paraprofessionals, secretaries, custodians, maintenance workers, bus drivers, van attendants, campus safety officers, and the technology department. A committee consisting of myself, Tom Quinn, our Director of Facilities, Paulette Donardo, our Director of People Services, and Heather Van Mater, our Director of Transportation, reviewed nominations and selected individuals based on the following criteria. Dedication to their job, inspiring, making a difference in the lives of staff, parents, and students. At this time, I'll be inviting their building principals to come up and introduce them. First, from Stony Brook Elementary, Steve Wilfing. That's a little more inspiring. Thank you, Mr. Suzo. Again, here for uh, Stony Brook Elementary School is Mr. Jay Lenarski. Uh, he's our campus safety officer. He arrived in 2006, and since that day, he has provided our school with a level of service that is unparalleled and transcends well beyond what you might think a campus safety officer would deliver. Yes, he does understand safety policies, and he has knowledge of emergency management procedures and how to assess and respond to potential dangers. You would expect that from a retired police officer and volunteer firefighter. But what Mr. Lenarski brings to Stony Brook is personal. He is caring and compassionate, accepting and forgiving. He listens to understand and is always willing to take an extra step to ensure that everyone is well taken care of. Don't just take my word for it. Here are some quotes from the nomination forms. He is always there for the students of Stony Brook. Having Mr. Lenarski as an approachable, familiar, and friendly face of the Stony Brook community is reassuring to a parent. The students and staff of Stony Brook are lucky to have an authentic and dedicated campus safety officer. He is one of the most dedicated staff members I have ever known. And finally, Jay Lenarski is a special human being, and we are truly blessed to have him in our school and in our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Jay Lenarski. Nicole G. and Freddie from Timberlane Middle School. Good evening again. Um, I'm proud to say this is the second year that Timberlane has two people represented as outstanding professionals of the year. Um, it is, I am lucky and fortunate to present Paraprofessional of the Year, Mrs. Patty Armstrong. Patty started at Hopewell Elementary back in 1988 and then joined Timberlane Middle School actually when the sixth grade moved to the middle school and in, two, since two, in 2000, and she has been part of our Timberlane family since then. Patty is committed to the staff, students, and our building. As one nomination stated, Patty has been a mainstay at Timberlane. She has enthusiastically embraced her role as paraprofessional. She is reliable in her duties, and in many instances has supported me in my teaching. She is a positive role model and respected by our students. In fact, Patty has mentored, mentored many Timberlane students. A staff member said, 
Patty has dedicated her whole working career to helping children. She has made connections with children in some fashion, and they love her. For me, personally, I love to watch when former students come back to visit Patty, often remembering from her work, perhaps working with them at the Hopewell Valley Aftercare Program, or specifically seeking out to reconnect and give her a hug. Patty, we love you at Timberlane. So please join me in congratulations, our Power Professional of the Year, Mrs. Patty Armstrong. And finally, from Central High School, Tana Smith. Hi again. So I am so, so lucky to um, have two amazing people to introduce to you tonight. And the, the next one that I have is our support staff professional of the year, Mr. Dave Radziski. In November of 1997, Dave came to Hopewell Valley working in the CHS custodial department. Always the hard worker, Dave was promoted to head custodian in April of 2008. Since then, he has kept Central High School as one of the most efficient, cleanest, and well-run schools in the district. And I've been to a lot of schools, I can say that, <laughs> knowing that well. He takes pride in his work, is extremely collaborative, and is adored by the staff and the students. A little known fact about Dave, every year he takes a week's vacation to go to Haiti on a humanitarian mission. He has been doing this now for several years. The last year and a half have been extremely trying with the construction that's been taking place at the high school, but no matter what was thrown at him, Dave took it in stride and always with a smile. And there have been days it's been difficult to smile, but somehow he manages to laugh. He looks at me and says, it'll be okay. And he's right, I believe him. He is humble, hardworking, a team player, and all around one of the nicest people you will ever meet with a kind, gentle, and giving heart. You can tell in the comments that have been made about him by those who nominated Dave. Dave is the person behind the scenes who keeps HVCHS running. He is one of the hardest working people I know with the strongest work ethic. You can see how much his team respects working with him. He handles any situation with a smile and a go get him attitude. He never complains about the overwhelming tasks of keeping the building intact. He inspires us to be better human beings by leading by example every day. And Dave is a very dedicated individual. He is truly an unsung hero. Central High School is a special place because of this man. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Dave Radizic on this well deserved honor. Next on the agenda is the violence and vandalism public hearing. Um, comments will be uh, accepted after it. It's the 2018-19 district mid-year report on violence, vandalism, and substance abuse. You are all more than welcome to stay. Um, there will be a budget presentation afterwards. You'd like to stay for that? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> 
Oh, come on, you. Honey. Really? You? <laughs> They're going out for the food. That's you should probably put the food in the yeah, room. Please eat the refreshments. Please take a snack on your way out. Cupcakes. Snack, cupcakes, pretzels. Cookies are extra special good. Yes. Or else Rosetta will have to go to the gym in the morning. <laughs> Quarter line budget presentation? I mean, it's, heavy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like growing lettuce. Yeah, that's it. We can talk. Oh, man down. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we're just going to turn it over to Mr. Suzo, who's going to walk us through. Yeah, at the end. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll accept it. So, um, Mr. Suzo will present the report, and then there will be an opportunity for public comment on this report. Then we will present the budget, opportunity for public comment, present the calendars, opportunity for public comment. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So, we're at the point in the year where um, we're required to present our half-year data, so these are incidents that took place um, between September and December, and then next October, I will present a full report um, for the 2018-2019 school year. So just some logistics as far as the forms go. If there's an incident of violence or vandalism, there is a form from the Department of Education that we're required to fill out. And with that, um, along with violence and vandalism, if there is a um, incident that involves harassment, intimidation, and bullying, there's also a form that we need to fill out for that as well. Um, and this is just an example of the form that is completed whenever there is an incident. If we look at the data so far this year, um, what you'll see is that we've had four incidents of substance abuse, two at the middle school and two at the high school. We've had one incident of vandalism We've had a total of six of violence. When we talk about violence, things like it could be a threat, it could be a physical altercation. Um, we've had three and three at the middle school and the high school. In reference to our HIB reports, we've had eight at the middle school so far and three at the high school. Out of the eight at the middle school, four were actually confirmed as a HIB and one was confirmed at the high school for a total of five. And then if we just look at some three-year trends, Keep in mind the numbers on the left for 2016-17 and 17-18 are for the full year. And the last column, 18-19, is only the first reporting period. But you can see kind of where we are in comparisons as far as different incidents that have occurred as well as um, you know our HIBs up to this point in the year. When we talk about programming and student safety, we have a lot of different things that come into play. Obviously, the board is well aware of our focus of cultural competency and character education that's been going on for a few years now. Um, you know, we, we took the opportunity last year to really uh, break down the HIB reports, specifically at the middle school, because they were higher than any of our other buildings. And to the credit of uh, Ms. G and Freddie, we've launched uh, a strong social emotional learning campaign at the middle school with a variety of different activities for our students really focusing on the areas of trends that we saw last year in our HIBs. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier by our student representative that we just recently had Byron Hurt who came to the high school and did some work with all of our students 9 through 12 and then also a parent community program in the evening um, based on race and diversity. We continue to work with our administrative team and our anti-bullying specialists. I meet with our anti-bullying specialists throughout the year, really to take a look at what our HIBs are up to this point in the school year. Are there any trends across schools or within schools? And what type of programming are we doing to address those issues? We have our counselors. 
so we're very fortunate to have a campus safety offer, officer in each building. We have two now at the high school who play an important role in this work. We have a phenomenal relationship with Hopewell Township Police Department. And we are fortunate as well to have a student assistance counselor both at the high school and the middle school, and as well as our anti-bullying specialists at all levels. Uh, strong relationship with healthy communities, healthy youth, with different clubs and organizations that take place and focus on these different issues. And in the state of New Jersey, although I would argue we're, we're constantly doing different events and programming throughout the entire school year, but the state does dictate that there is one week in October, the first through the fifth, which is a week of respect. Our counselors plan a variety of different activities with our building administration. Um, and then also later in that month by the state, there is a violence and vandalism awareness week, where again, our counselors and our building administration uh, basically plan events, morning announcements, games, all kinds of different activities, depending upon the grade level in order to reinforce. But uh, as I said before, those are types of activities that we do throughout the entire school year. So again, a, a mid-year glance as where we are as data, and then obviously I'll present the full report to the board probably in October for next year. Any questions? In accordance with the provisions of the New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law Act, the Hubble Valley Regional Board of Education. Has caused notice of this public hearing to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof communicated to the Hubble Valley News, the Times, the Trentonian, on. Notice of this meeting is also sent to Comcast Cable and Verizon. Um, public comment is now, or comment is now open. <laughs> it's only related to the, only related yeah, limit to the, limit to the violence and vandalism. Does anybody want to comment on violence and vandalism? <coughs> Seeing none, public comment is now closed. Is there a roll call? It's voice vote. Okay. Um, all those in favor? We need a motion. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, we need a motion, please. Move. <laughs> All those in favor of approving the um, report? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstained? Motion carries. All right. <coughs> Dr. Smith, you're next on our agenda. Yes, uh, tonight we present to the board and to the community our preliminary budget for review and adoption by the Board of Education. Um, I'll take you through the budget timeline. Um, in January, we began meeting with our budget managers. Actually, this takes place uh, late in the fall, but it uh, occurs officially in earnest in January. Um, we begin discussions with our finance and facility committee regarding our um, budget development. We have our initial board retreat that took place in February. We continue discussions with the Finance and Facilities Committee. In March, on March 5th, we had our governor's budget message. Um, and shortly after that, within 48 hours by code, they are required to release those state aid figures, which we received. Um, that took place on the 7th. And on Monday the 11th, last Monday, we had our board budget retreat. Tonight, we have our preliminary budget adoption. Um, for the board to review this uh, our preliminary budget is due to the county on Wednesday March 20th um, We do not have to approve a final budget until May 6th um, so There are opportunities to make adjustments or changes from this evening all the way through May 6th Meaning that we have continued discussion of the budget on the board through a work session as well as discussions with the Finance and Facilities Committee um, I would like to call your attention to everything we should be doing in the district should relate to our mission statement. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of words with that. But our goal, our role, our mission 
is in partnership with the community is to provide a comprehensive caring educational experience which nurtures the unique talents of each individual, creates a fulfilled, socially responsible, lifelong learner, develops confidence and capabilities to face challenges of a rapidly changing world, and promotes a culture of respect which values diversity. As partners, we will provide sufficient resources and talented and committed to staff that creates a safe environment where all students flourish. Through this mission and strategic plan, the Board of Education expects all students will achieve the New Jersey core content curriculum standards at all grade levels. That's really what drives us and what thinks. We want to provide sufficient resources um, and talented staff. Um, you heard tonight of some of our very talented staff members, although they are just kind of the tip of the iceberg of all of our, our talented staff to provide an education to our school. With that, I draw your attention to the things that we've accomplished over the years. Budget conversations are never easy, but we've really laid a foundation and a strong foundation in this community of really turning up um, our, our return on investment to our community. If you see it, our high school ranking, if you go by the New Jersey monthly rankings, it's our highest ranking ever. Um, New Jersey School District in terms of niche rankings, our highest ever SAT scores. Um, and ranked the number 185th best school in America by niche. Our athletic awards, our athletic programs have been awarded. Um, our art programs have been awarded. But more importantly, if you look at what we can provide the students, I would argue that we are one of the few comprehensive high schools left on that top list in New Jersey Monthly. We have a working auto shop, a working wood shop, and an engineering lab. Um, we as a board and as a district eliminated co-curricular participation fees. We have uh, approved well over 100 extra and co-curricular enrichment opportunities for our students. Um, we also have very, very favorable class sizes. Um, really, whatever um, area you look at, we have continued to work to excel and try to refocus any areas that we need to. Um, our business office has been recognized repeatedly for their budgeting and their, their work in to develop and craft the budget. We have, and are incredibly thankful for this, passed the referendum and is now coming to a conclusion, um, but the community supported us in bringing that online. Um, but again, more than anything, we talk about the impact of on our students, and that is something that you can't put a price tag on. I would hope that the best majority of students are walking out of this school district having had a positive experience. Um, and regardless of whether you're in AP Calculus BC or whether you're in one of our special needs classes, anywhere in between, that you're getting the best possible education that we can provide to you. So as we developed our budget, our priorities were to maintain all of these programs and services. We built these, we want to maintain them. Um, we want to meet all of our contractual and salary benefit obligations. We look to, and have done this for several years, evaluate programs and adjust staffing to re reflect our enrollment and budgeting needs, and also develop a budget that prepares us for an uncertain future. When we look at that, um, we look at our enrollment history and projection. Um, the projection in red was what the demographer that we had hired to look at our district, where he said we would end up at this time and where we are actually ending up. And there's a delta there. So we are probably about 400 students difference between where they said we would end up and where we are. That's to the good, but that is a number of um, students that we thought that we were not going to receive based on demographic projections that we are continuing in our school. Some other kind of enrollment things, the entering students. Entering students, there we go. Um, interesting thing has happened, um, although if you look at the number of students we're graduating at the high school, we're still bringing in less students um, in the elementary level than we're graduating. However, um, we have seen, you've seen an uptick recently of kindergarten students. Will this continue? We do not know, but it is an interesting um, phenomenon. But again, um, we have not seen um, the significant decrease that was predicted by the demographic. Demographer, sorry. Um, and CHS, here's another area where we expected to see a significant 
um, decrease over the years. We have, um, by all accounts, stabilized over the last three years in terms of our enrollment. And that is something I think is a good sign because we typically would lose students between uh, eighth and ninth grade, which we still do, people choose. Um, but our numbers at the high school uh, have not decreased to the level that, that the demographer predicted and that we anticipated. So uh, basically sharing all this information is just to kind of say, uh, looking at our schools overall, um, there is not, there's not a, a huge gap that we predicted at this time five years ago where we would be. Our schools, particularly if you look at Tollgate, are functioning close to capacity and those schools with a split between um, the areas that those areas are maximum capacity and what that would mean was, for example, art, our music might be, it might be art on a cart where we would take that classroom or music um, where we have things, for example, um, at Stony Brook music and Spanish are still doubled up in a classroom. Although this says Stony Brook is not operating at full max capacity, um, what the, the architect says and what the demographer might say is full capacity in reality um, does not equal that. Um, so that's where I say is an uncertain future. If additional students were to become online um, in the near future, there's a question of where they would be housed and how we would house them um, as we work through this. Um, all right, let me just transition over to also to class sizes. As I mentioned previously, in terms of your return on investment, I would argue that we have very, very favorable class sizes. And this is something that we're proud of and that we want to preserve for now and into the future. Um, however, um, this is an area that I know as folks look at our schools, I would argue that it draws uh, many students or many parents to our schools. Um, but if you do not have students in the school or on the elementary level, you say, well, that's, um, you know, those are nice numbers. But again, I would argue that the elementary classroom of today is much different than it was um, years ago. There's a lot of things going on in these classrooms and, and having class sizes in the low um, to mid 20s is very favorable and I think it's beneficial to our students. All right, so we're going to get into the, the budget uh, portion, the, the actual dollars and cents of this, and I'm going to tag team the, um, the next part of the presentation with Mr. Calavita, our award-winning uh, school business administrator. But I'd just like to say, you know, we see our role, our number one priority, is building a budget to protect our school district and to deliver an excellent education to the students of the Hopewell Valley. Um, our mission statement drives us as part of this role we want to build a district for not only today but for the future and how we do that is important is important to us and important to um, I think the families of Hopewell Valley so it's important that we budget not only for today but a budget that prepares us for the future um, and as we talk through the numbers um, we'll circle back to that but I'm going to go on over to our revenues and Mr. Calvi you can jump in but I, I will just say you know, st uh, state funds our revenues at a glance. Um, New Jersey provides funding for public schools in the form of general operations and funding designed to particular expenses. And Hopewell, our revenue from the state is uh, less than 5%. The federal funds, we receive less, th um, about 1% of uh, funds from the federal government. Now, this is where you'll see in districts similar to ours, they might receive far more in us, and, we're, and we'll talk a little bit about our increase in a second, but um, you know, this is looking at the monies that we pay out as taxpayers, what's coming back to the district. Property taxes here, and we recognize this, um, account for about 88.6 of our budget. Fund balance, we've used our fund balance, that means monies that are main at the end of the fiscal year, uh, and that money becomes part of the fund balance and we apply that to our next year. Um, we've done that in upwards of 5%. And miscellaneous revenue, that's uh, staff child tuition, stu uh, staff health benefits um, contributions, and other district tuition payments like facility rentals, um, tw transportation charges, um, E-rate grants, that's about 1% of our total budget. So let's uh, talk about state aid for the past 10 years. Now, if you were around back in 2009, 2010, 
our state aid that, or monies that we received from the state were over four million dollars um, in the 2010-11 budget that dropped off significantly we had an over 80 percent reduction in our state aid um, and we had to make um, some significant changes in our district um, the state government has been increasing the state aid to us um, over this years however i'd like to note the areas that are in red are n not directly tied to the typical state aid but they are a direct result of our school choice aid and they are students that we receive from outside the district we receive funds from the state um, for those this year of our um, state budget increase of three hundred and fifty one thousand dollars sixty seven thousand dollars of that or nineteen percent was due to our uh, choice program um, specifically to help fund the uh, siblings of choice students it's a very nice program we have 13 students who are part of the choice program but that it's expanded um, for their siblings so as we accept one student into our our district if they have younger siblings um, the state allows us and provides us additional funding for their siblings to participate um, in our district so I'm going to keep going kind of high level um, and share kind of where our money goes not kind of this is where our money goes and, uh, and it's allotted for our budget um, and we'll get down into the weeds in this in a second but um, the vast majority of our our monies go directly tied to general education programs and services 41 percent um, special education at 17 percent employee benefits at 15 percent uh, I'm sorry 18 percent um, and you can see how it all breaks down through that So here's another chart just so you see it's one of the struggles we have as a school district of trying budget and I'll move my melon head in a second um, so you can see but the if you look at the averages over the last five years our settlements with our associations were in excess of two percent so that's 58 or 55.8 percent of our budget or 50 million dollars has increased more than two percent so our cap is at two percent 55% of that budget has increased more than 2%. Um, if you look at our insurance, um, that is 13% of our budget. Our medical insurance, which is our biggest driver, but also our prescription, uh, equates to $12 million or 13.9%. That's increased over 8% um, in the, during that time also. During that time, and even if you look at an increase of this year of using our bank cap and, and waivers we're still coming in at a five-year average of 2.11 percent over our budget during that time while our biggest budget drivers of insurance and staffing have increased more than the cap so this is where i turn it over to mr Calavita to walk us through um, the hard numbers so I'll turn that over to him um, this this slide is really a uh, a uh, chart presentation look at Tom's graph that he did a few slides back. Um, just putting, as you can see, most of our dollars into our instructional program. Um, regular instruction includes again all of our regular programs, including our our co-curricular and athletic programs, special education, just an extension of our our regular general ed program. But that's the majority of of where our money goes. Um, the next biggest driver is again our the benefits that we provide for all staff, not just not including uh, our health insurances, but our uh, tuition reimbursements to all staff members, um, pension contributions to some of our staff members, social security contributions, workers' compensation insurance. Um, you know, coupled with our health. <coughs> so again, a, a, a huge driver in our budget that's also increasing greater than than the cap of two. Um, our central services, some of the other major budget drivers, um, our transportation department, which uh, helps transport in excess of 3,000 students each day, um, is increasing at 2.3%, largely um, uh, driven by uh, our employees. Um, we, we need drivers and, and, and uh, attendants to, to manage those buses for us. We've tried to keep our discretionary expenses and uh, operation of our garage um, and parts and fuel and things like that at, at a flat level to help cover those costs. Again, operations and maintenance is a, is a very big part of our budget. 
again, we've tried to keep that budget, the, the expenditures flat with the increases only coming in, in the, the people. We need to, to maintain that operation. Um, capital outlay, we don't really have any capital outlay monies in the budget this year. That $101,000 assessment is from the state of New Jersey um, as a payment towards the ROD grant money that we received over the last several years. It's kind of like an interest payment back to the state. Um, we have a debt payment. Um, this is including the debt of our new additions, especially at the high school, and a lot of the roof and HVAC work done district-wide, uh, maintaining a relatively flat level before it drops off uh, two years from now. Um, but overall, a, a 2.4 increase in our expenditure budget. Um, again, as we've been pointing out, it is in excess of the you know, our general or our allowable tax levy of 2%. Um, again, most of the money that we tried, it's, we are putting most of our money into the classroom um, in support of our students. Okay, in New Jersey and in, in, in mall budgets, uh, your revenues must match your expenditure. So this is a breakdown of how uh, the revenues we are using based upon the definitions that we presented in a, in a previous slide. Um, we're using uh, $2.7 million of our fund balance or surplus, uh, monies that were, that were derived from previous budgets to help fund next year's budget. Um, the vast majority, is, as Dr. Smith mentioned, $81 million and change uh, make up the majority of our funding, 88, almost 89%. State aid, um, which we did get an increase this year, but we're still below levels from uh, pre-2010, um, make up you know, a little less than 5% of our budget. Miscellaneous revenue is, is our revenues that we are able to generate in-house, as we mentioned before. The tuitions we're able to charge um, outside residents, the use of our facilities, um, some other local grants that we're able to derive uh, make up less than 1% of our budget. And as Tom uh, mentioned earlier, federal aid. Federal aid, just a clarification, does not go towards our general budget. Okay, It, it goes towards special programs. It helps to fund our special education department. Um, it helps to fund our Title I folks, our bilingual folks. Um, and then there's also some money in there for training and um, diversity, uh, tr diversity training and overall staff and student uh, professional development. Um, those monies are dollar in, dollar out. So we get the monies for a specific purpose and we're able to spend it on those particular projects. Okay, uh, so again, our revenues for next year are increasing at 2.4%. So it matches our expenditure increases. This shows a um, how all of our, yeah, I didn't, sorry, um, this shows how our uh, use of our general fund tax levy and our debt service tax levy uh, pan out this year. We are looking at, yes, a higher increase than we've looked at over the past several years. Um, to kind of help stave off those increases that exceeded the cap of 2%. Um, overall, over the past six years, we're averaging a 2.11% general fund tax levy increase with an overall increase, including our debt service of 2.4%. Just a refresher for folks, the um, debt service tax levy is monies that have been levied through a bond referendum. Um, most recently, the one used to uh, expand the high school, uh, the most recent $35 million referendum um, is also in the budget. Okay, we've been talking a lot about uh, the use of surplus this year during the board's budget conversations. Um, surplus comes from a, a variety of different places. Um, we are permitted by law, by state statute, to keep in a um, surplus account no more than 2% of our audited expenditures. So actual expenditures from the prior year are able to be reserved up to 2% of the, that number. And that's our true emergency fund account. There is an audited excess surplus line that is m uh, dollars that exceed that 2%. And they must be budgeted. Any uh, numbers that, are, that exceed 2% of our audited expenditures must be budgeted in the subsequent year. So I use that example. 
If the money was identified in the 2016-17 audit, it must be budgeted in the 2018-19 budget. Okay. Then the last surplus we have is general operating budget fund balance. Um, if you look at our user-friendly budget, um, this was a question that our, many of our board members had. Uh, it shows monies that are left over at the end of the fiscal year, but what it doesn't um, explicitly state is that those monies in large part are already, have already been budgeted in the subsequent year. Okay? It includes money that's, that's budgeted in the subsequent year as well as the money that is at 2% uh, surplus dollars. This shows a history of fund balances as we've used them over the years. Um, back in the 13-14 area, we were using about $1.7 million worth of surplus, and it kind of fluctuates anywhere between $1.5 and $2 million over that time. Um, as we move towards referendum in, this, in the 16-17, 17-18 school years, uh, we were using more surplus in an effort to be um, respectful to the taxpayers uh, as we were putting new debt on the books. Last year we hit uh, a high of over four and a half million dollars uh, use of surplus. Um, and this year we're trying to get that number back down uh, to a reasonable number so that we don't become completely dependent on surplus uh, going forward. More surplus than we can uh, handle. Um, when we talk about surplus, is that the next slide? No, we'll skip that. Um, when we talk about surplus, what we want to be careful is, is you must be able to generate in each subsequent budget the amount of surplus that you're using in the current budget, or you need to try to reduce expenditures. Um, I've used the term um, using a gift to pay for a recurring expense that you might not be able to afford. Uh, for example, if you get a gift from a parent and you decide to go out and buy a car with that, but you only can cover the payment for three months with that gift. You need to be able to sustain the payments on that car with the only the money that you're able to generate, not money that you're getting in as a one-time gift. If you can't sustain that payment with your own funds, you're gonna have a difficult time being able to maintain that car. Um, and that's similar here to what you try to do with surplus. You try to use surplus in each budget year, you're required to, but you wanna try to be able to use an, an, a number that you're comfortable with being able to generate year after year. Because the year that you can't generate the surplus is the year you're going to have to do, you're gonna have to reduce your expenditures. That's the only way to cover it. Okay, go to the next slide. This is how it breaks down um, in the 1920 school year. You would see Hopewell Borough having a nine cent increase, the township having a five cent increase, and Pennington Borough having a three cent increase over the prior year's taxes based upon the average home assessment. I think we're going to go into, I take those other slides. Okay, we kind of talked about this slide already, um, the pros and cons of using surplus to balance your budget. Um, pros and cons, pros allow us to maintain all of our existing programs. We don't have to make drastic cuts to, to come to a, a manageable level. Um, the increase on our budget, the, the tax levy is minimized when we use surplus. Um, and monies go, that we could have had go back to the taxpayer versus building a, a surplus. Um, in the past, we've tried to use some surplus to do projects without going to referendum. Previous years, we were able to do HVAC projects at Bear Tavern and Tollgate, repair some roofing do paving around the district, and a number of other projects that were not able to be included in the referendum, this past referendum. Again, the cons we've talked about, there is a time when using surplus is not sustainable. You're not able to make up the difference in the next year's budget. As you use more surplus out of the, use more monies out of a previous budget, you may have less money in the current budget that will be left over. Um, again, and if we don't, we're not able to replenish our reserve accounts, our capital reserve. Uh, we may not be able to, to tackle some of the other projects that were not covered by uh, the referendum. Okay. 
we'll go from here. Just uh, so to get us to this point um, th that Bob spoke about earlier, we have reduced on the elementary level five full-time staff members. We will reduce for next year. Um, we will eliminate undersubscribed classes at the high school. Um, and there's still discussion about um, defining what is undersubscribed and where that number is. But we do have a number of classes running um, in the single digits at the high school, looking at reducing those and um, our 50% reduction in non-mandated summer hours. Um, those are uh, the programs that we, or services that we might provide to our families and parents um, that we do over the summer. However, um, this would be a, a reduction in, in terms of that. So it's not that we're just coming at um, this budget without making reductions. These are reductions um, on the table here are in excess of $400,000. Um, looking at this. Um, the board has discussed about uh, what would it take to, to reduce a level of um, funding. Um, so we're not using that level of surplus funding. Um, and quite frankly, we've made adjustments over the years um, to decrease all of our, as much discretionary funding as possible. Um, this next level of cuts are um, gonna impact programs and services. Um, and these aren't pretty, and we, have, we take no pleasure in bringing this budget to you or bringing these potential expenditure reductions to anyone in this room. I want to make that clear. I'm not recommending any of these, but if we're forced in a situation where we're going to reduce, these are what's on the table, um, and that is what we're looking at. Um, these are programs that I think set us apart and services that set us apart from other schools. Um, and as we develop this budget and trying to protect and preserve all the things that we have done um, and continue and want to do in the future, um, just preserving that. We're not expanding. You're, there's no new programs in this budget. Um, there's no new services in this budget. Um, we're reducing programs and services to get us to this level, and we still can't come to cap. If we need to go under this, if the board's recommendation is for us to come under, um, or reduce our level of surplus, um, we're looking at impact cuts on their programs. And I want to make this clear, I don't want to do it. Um, but if we are in a situation where we must, these are the areas that we're looking at. With the effort to preserve classrooms, preserve class sizes um, in our schools. Um, so let me, Bob, if you could just kind of talk through the next sure. couple of slides. Okay, um, something that, that drives our, the tax rate in this community in the Hopeful Valley is something that we don't control. This is something that is um, determined by the local assessors in each town and um, kind of corroborated by the Mercer County tax assessor. Um, the numbers, the rateables in a, in a general term are the value of the properties in all, the, in all each town and each town is um, graded separately and that's how it generates their tax rate it's not all if we were one community you'd have one tax rate but since we're three separate there's a way that is determined so we figure out all the valuable the rateables of the values of the properties and you can see in two of our communities we see significant drop-offs in the value of the properties okay it could mean anything it could mean homeowners getting their properties reassessed it could mean uh, businesses leaving uh, the community, going somewhere else. It could be, um, again, a reassessment of those businesses. Maybe they sell off a piece of the, the company and they're going to move it to a different town. And they, they petition to have their um, tax assessed property downgraded. And you can see that happening in both the borough and the township. Um, Pennington Borough is seeing a uh, slight up or a, a rather sizable uptick in their rateables. Um, the next step, the percent share, is how those rateables are kind of put into a formula down at the Mercer County Tax Assessor's Office, and they use that, they equalize it to make uh, apples to apples, and they determine what percentage of each dollar is going to be contributed by each municipality. Okay, um, Hopewell Borough is going from a 6.55 share to a 6.65 share, so they're seeing an increase in the amount that they're responsible for. Hopewell Township is seeing a decrease 
in their contribution from 83.7 cents to 83.3 cents. And Pennington Borough is also seeing an increase in their contribution from 9.7 cents to 10.08 cents. And again, you could see how that kind of would work. Pennington Borough did see a, a nice uptick in their rateables, which means they would take on a bigger piece of the pie. Okay. Uh, we also show the uh, enrollment. Um, there are two ways of dividing up the uh, monies, either by student enrollment or by uh, the percent share equalized valuations. We voted years and years ago to use um, the value of the property to divide up the, the, uh, the tax levy. If you were to try to switch to an enrollment-based approach, you'd need to have a referendum pass in each of the three municipalities separately to have a change there. But again, this is something that is a long-standing formula and um, calculated by the Mercer County Tax Assessor, so we don't control this. That concludes our preliminary budget presentation for this evening. Again, I say to you with all sincerity that we um, take no pleasure in providing this, uh, presenting this budget, but I will say what we have done is done our best to preserve the programming and education for our students the best we can. And um, even with that, we're reducing staff um, and we're cutting services for our community. Um, and um, if we do need to do more, we will look and we can um, you know, run over with the finance and facilities and or the full board uh, where further, further reductions would take place. Um, but at this point, our budget um, is being recommended as it stands. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and Bob is here to answer the money questions. Would anyone from the board like to comment, question? Yeah, I think I'd like to comment. So um, I will say this. Uh, I think this, over the last couple weeks, it's probably been as productive discussions of, as I've had on my time on the board in terms of my fellow, being with my fellow board members and, and working on understanding exactly our, our situation. And I will commend uh, Dr. Smith and Mr. Colavita for all they've done in preparing this and educating us as to our, our you know, where we stand and the rationale for recommending what they're recommending. Um, but what I'm going to say is that at, at the current time, I am not able to, I feel that I'm not able to support uh, this budget going forward. Uh, I think we're all in agreement that we need to start to stop uh, increasing our use of surplus. Right? I think we're all in agreement on that. We need to reverse that trend. Um, my difference of opinion is that um, I don't believe we need to take the immediate severe reduction in our use of surplus this year. Uh, I have advocated for a more gradual measured approach to doing that. Um, I think you can, I think both approaches are valid. Uh, I think both approaches in a couple of years would ultimately lead to the same position in terms of the amount of surplus that we're using. Uh, the, the difference is just that uh, by going to 5.27% increase this year, that's, that's $3.8 million. Uh, from, from what Mr. Calavita has shared, I believe we can uh, reverse that trend with an increase of 2.3%, for instance. So that's, you know, there's a significant difference there. Um, why am I of this opinion, it's mainly for two reasons. Uh, the first is that um, I think a tax levy increase of 5.27% is gonna be very difficult for some of our local residents, especially those on fixed incomes. That's, that's a pretty significant increase. Um, if you look at the amount that we're talking about, 3.8 million versus what we've discussed in terms of cuts, $400,000, that, that's very highly weighted towards increases and I, I would advocate for something with more of a balance. Um, the other reason is that as a board member who was on the board at the time uh, we were developing the referendum projects, um, our message back at that time was just that um, we were trying to do that in a very cost-effective way. We had uh, a level of uh, state aid that would be provided and we'd be able to fund those projects in a very responsible way. 
Uh, and at the time, we had some, ver as you saw on the, the chart, some very low percentage increases. And, and part of the reason for doing that was to say, we are being responsible, we're using, uh, we're, we're taxing in accordance with the amount that we need that we're spending. This is detailed on our referendum FAQ that's, that's still available on the district website. Uh, at that time, we were even able to put some money, $3 million into our capital reserve. So we were running well there. And I think because the, the community had confidence in us uh, being responsible, they overwhelmingly approved our $35 million referendum. And I just feel at this point to go back and say, uh, we need to go to, to a very significant increase this year feels disingenuous as, as someone who was on the board making those types of statements at the time. Um, as Dr. Smith had said, uh, and, and we mentioned here, I think the difficulties that we've had this, this in, in terms of understanding and coming to a, a consensus on this budget has been a good thing. It, it's made us very aware of uh, where we are as a district. Um, I'll, I'll say this, as a member of the, the board, I've advocated for increasing opportunities for our students both academically and in terms of extracurriculars the last couple of years, and we're very proud of what we've done. But it's come at a cost, and I don't think, I certainly didn't come to the realization of what that cost truly was until this budget discussion. So, uh, you know, just we mentioned, I think just came out in the last two weeks, this realization that we've, we've really um, need to be more cognizant of, of our small sections at the high school, for instance. So we're, we're having that, that talk. It, it's gone up. 100% in four years. We, we, we can do, I think we can do a better job there. Especially that, you know, when you look at it, we'll, we'll have smaller class sizes coming into the high school. So I think there are opportunities there. So basically for that reason, I would advocate a smaller uh, local tax levy for this year. One that stabilizes us, gets us on the right trend, starts using less surplus with the goal of, of of getting back to our historical levels in a couple of years. And, and a key message is just we, we have to get our uh, operating budget growth in line with the 2% tax levy. We have no choice. We, you know, it, it's just a limitation we have. We have to, we have to do that. Thank you for your time. Yeah, yeah I have a I've been this my second year chairing the finance committee, and I will say that this is the the most difficult thing that we can go through year over year, and that is to talk about the money. Right? Um, collaboration is uh, is the most difficult thing that humans can do with each other. Right? It is uh, it is when we get together and we have ideas to try to push something forward. And um, I I work hand in hand with everyone here um, on this board. I would say that um, this past two months, I've spent sleepless nights burning and piling through data for, our, for over 10, 10 years worth of historical data and trends. And I came up with you know, some uh, surprising and alarming figures. And that is, you know, we're doing things here in the United States uh, that no other country is doing. And uh, we've now been able to furnish health care for 16 million Americans off of some of the things that we're seeing here locally in the district. So the fact that we're not taking, we're taking $200 trillion, $280 trillion, and we're actually providing health care for six, 16 million Americans is a lot of what we're seeing here. So it is unfortunate that we are getting hit locally. But what we see is what I expected to see from when I took the three years to assess the exact district that I wanted to move into with the absolute best community, with the absolute best growth in programs, and staffing, and just general administration overall, this is an amazing place. I could never have imagined years ago that this place would provide so much for my children and so much for everyone, um, me in general. Um, I would say that uh, I'm beyond. Um, this budget cycle I know has been difficult. I don't know if there's an easy way around it. I've looked at numbers in 50,000 different ways, models. I own a business called Collab Intelligence. It's collaboration and intelligence. I look at big data models, and I would say this is a very interesting model, but 
you can see trends even across the state. You know, numbers that we've not seen, 10% growth year over year when it comes down to health care. These are difficult decisions. We, if you look at the ranking and our performance in this district compared to state and, and the country, we are rising exponentially due to the administration, the programming, the staff, and everyone involved in that entire process. So as difficult as this increase it uh, would be, at 5.27%, I would say I would give everything I have, and I already have, to every child that's a part of this district to hopefully grow this throughout the United States and the world. And you know what? If this means a template for what we're doing today, for this difficult increase, I will take everything I have to be a part of that growth. And I am obviously on the other side of Adam, and I respect him tremendously on everything that he has done for this district, this board, and a lot of people disagree with me on many items. But this budget is a serious thing, and we have to do better at it. Obviously, we need to make big benefits across the board, but what we're doing as a facility, as people, caring for our children to make better in this, we have to continue this trend. And I'm promoting this 5.2% increase, 5.27% increase, as a part of keeping and maintaining what we already have. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Um, as a member of the Finance Committee, um, I would say this was not an easy decision. Uh, we did look at a lot of the numbers, and, and one of the reasons we said why this year to fix it is because we have the $2.2 in banked cap that will um, no longer be available to us after this year. So to leave that money on the table when we're looking at cuts and trying to get our budget in order, um, to me, seems irresponsible. Um, I moved here for the schools. This was my target district when I lived in Ewing. Uh, our, my whole family, my sister even moved here. We moved here for the schools. And I have about five other families that came from Ewing around the same time as us. Not knocking Ewing. I'm just saying, hope well, schools are fabulous, and that's why we wanted to come here. And I'm not willing to risk any cuts or, or um, diminishing of programs and not valuing our staff, quite frankly, um, by not supporting this budget. Um, so I would be one of the board members who's been here um, for the past, uh, this is my fifth year, um, and so I have been through the referendum. And at the time, we knew that we were making the best decision to, um, some of our schools had, you know, holes in their ceilings and, uh, not holes, but they were leaking. Um, windows needed to be changed. We needed to become more efficient. Um, and we managed to do all of that because of the confidence of our taxpayers. And we were able to do it um, receiving 40% back um, from the state in order to do this through referendum. So for that, we're incredibly grateful. Um, in doing that, we knew that there would be a tax increase at some point um, before we have a debt roll off um, in 2022. So that we understood. and. Uh, I don't even know how we did it with, with all the increases we've had year over year in salary and benefits, but somehow, even if we have to go to the full 5.27%, we've only gone up 2.11% over the course of the last five, six years. Um, that's really incredible, and it says a lot about our restraint and how much respect we have for our taxpayer money. Um, but what I also have an incredible amount of respect for are many of the people who are sitting out there in our room. And um, you guys are my children's teachers and coaches. And, um, you know, when we looked at this budget and we looked at, you know, the banked cap that, that we were able to amount because year over year we didn't spend to cap, so we banked that. Um, I, I look at that and I say, you know, how can we let that money roll off when it's going to mean we have to have cuts. With all due respect, nobody has shown me any way to take, to, to let go of that 2.2 or some portion of it and 
in the next several years get to a point where our surplus is going to be at a manageable level. I haven't seen that. Now, fortunately, this is a preliminary budget, and we have all incredibly committed to um, look at those numbers and try to get to a more respectful place where it's not just viscerally painful for us. Um, but there's work to be done for the next two months, but it won't stop there, regardless of where we go with this budget, 5.27 or something below that. We have to make a commitment to um, run this district in perhaps a different way. Um, we're gonna have to look outside the box um, because it doesn't look like the state is really gonna give us enough money to fill the hole that we're creating. And it doesn't look that they're gonna change the funding formula anytime soon. So um, we as a board are committed to looking at the smaller areas of cost savings, but also looking bigger for bigger areas of cost savings. But we can't make those cuts right now and in the next year. We can make some of them, but the bigger ones are gonna take a bigger strategy. Um, and we've all said we're committed to doing that. Um, so I do support the Finance Committee in their recommendation with the caveat that it doesn't stop in the next two months and it will not stop for the next several years. We will um, continue to be very diligent about our work and our efforts to change um, how we're funding. Would anyone else like to speak or shall I open it up to public comment? Okay. Members of the public are invited to address the board on any matter for a maximum of three minutes during this portion of the meeting. You're asked to state your name, address, and municipality in response to your comments. The Board of Education may respond or direct the superintendent to do so. The board may also opt to take the matter up at a future meeting so the matter is researched by the district administration. Public comment is now open. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy Greener. Um, address two, right? Yes, please. 35 Avalon Road in Hopewell Township. Um, the year was 1980. Dr. Noon Dr. William Noonan was superintendent in Hopewell Valley. The teachers were paying 1.5% toward their medical benefits. Democrat Brendan Byrne was in office, and the pensions were funded at 105%. Teaching was a respected profession, and I was thrilled to be hired to teach in Hopewell Valley. When my family moved here, we could barely afford the house that we bought, let alone the taxes, but felt very lucky to live in an area with such a great reputation. I taught in three different schools in Hopewell for a combination of 37 years, have been a taxpayer for the last 23 years, retired two and a half years ago, and I'm often a substitute at Timberlane. One of the reasons I felt the need to leave the profession was the fact that my salary was getting lower every year. My medical benefits were over $8,500, while my raise one year was 112. That was a $3 a week raise before taxes, not even enough to buy a cup of coffee. This is happening to the teachers in Hopewell Valley. They made more money years ago than they do today, and this just can't continue. Governor Christie's implementation of Chapter 78 has been devastating to teachers. Many teachers have second and third jobs. When I first started teaching, many of the women I worked with were there for pocket money. This is no longer the case. Teachers in the district are often the breadwinners of the family or the single parent solely responsible for their family. Coming back to substitute at Timberlane has given me truly a unique perspective. I'm in a variety of classrooms and all different grade levels. The teachers I see there are hard at work, even without a contract. Hopewell Valley teachers don't just prepare and, ex and execute lessons, grade papers, manage the classroom, meet with parents, work with administration, discuss students and curriculum with their teams and grade levels, take professional development classes, but now also train to protect their students against violent intruders. These teachers often act as, act as surrogate parents, disciplinarians, counselors, mentors, role models, data keepers, and now must also advocate for themselves and their students on a local and national level. Teachers are responsible for every other profession, and our students have gone on to be amazing contributors to society. We have graduated authors, teachers, mechanics, entrepreneurs, electricians, politicians, nurses, doctors, plumbers, men and women serving in the military, musicians, and yes, even board members. 
I'm assuming this is why you all chose to work or serve in Hopewell Valley, to move the educational system forward and continue to be proud of all that's accomplished here. In order for that to happen, you must have teachers that feel valued and respected. If you are willing to to accept the accolades that you mentioned and that the district receives, you must also show respect to those who are the direct result of that praise. Treating teachers fairly will attract the best candidates and the reputation of this district will continue. Teachers should not feel they're in a collective begging process, but truly a collective bargaining one. I challenge you to go into the classrooms in the district where you sit on the board and see what's happening there. I guarantee you will have a true appreciation for what the teachers of Hopewell Valley do each and every day. Your teachers deserve a fair contract. I didn't see the red. So sorry. <laughs> well done. Thank you, Ms. Greener. Does anyone else have any budget-related comments they'd like to make? Seeing none, uh, public comment is now closed. Okay, Mr. Calavino, may we have a roll call, please? Oh, a motion, please, to um, approve the preliminary budget. So moved. Second. <coughs> Uh, Mr. D. Donato. Yes. Uh, Ms. Lynn. Yes. Ms. Polara. Yes. Mr. Sawicki. No. Ms. Tracy. Yes. Ms. O'Reilly. Yes. And Ms. Murray. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to the presentation of the district calendars. All right. Tonight, uh, later on in the board meeting, the board is going to review and approve the calendars. But uh, what I wanted to do was give the folks in the audience an opportunity to look at the calendars prior to um, and comment prior to approval by the Board of Education. So in a second, I'm going to uh, bring up the calendars for the next five years. Um, what we have done is we had a, is there anyone left in the calendar committee? Oh, all right. Okay, some calendar committee folks. We had 15 people sit on that calendar committee. We had uh, teachers, parents, and administrators review our calendars for the next five years. Um, so these calendars that I'm going to show you have 182 instructional days. Staff are contracted for 185 days. They have a set last day of school. There's no adding half days on to the end um, if there's a snow day. We had a long discussion about this and felt that this should make the end of the year more meaningful because when we added snow days and they were half days, everybody kind of uh, wrote them off as full days. The calendars contain two e-learning days and one snow day built in on the Friday of Memorial Day weekend. Uh, additional snow days will be taken from spring break. So just to, to reinforce the end of the, the set, end of the school year. That was a big goal for the committee. They wanted to set end of the school year and they wanted to not, if all possible, go into the 20s, um, the June 20s, if we could end in the teens. Um, this does keep the three early dismissal days for teacher afternoon professional development like we had this afternoon, but, um, and this was really stressed by the teachers, moving those from Monday to Wednesday because if you had a half day on Monday, you were losing a lot of our specials. If you're a special area teacher, we have a lot of Mondays are off that builds up over time. And one of our committee members actually did a whole spreadsheet about how many days Monday classes were behind the other classes. Um, this reduces President's Day weekend um, from uh, two days to one day um, and just having off on the Monday. Long term, these um, calendars include Diwali and Chinese New Year um, when they fall during the week. And I do believe we have, do we have both students? There's here. All right. So we, uh, you actually presented to the board. So this calendar includes both of those holidays, although for the next couple of years, um, they don't fall during uh, the week. Um, so, but they, they are acknowledged as we move forward. So my recommend, I'm gonna I'll go through the calendars in a second, but my recommend, uh, recommendation is that the board do the following. Because this, we, this, these calendars um, 
include some significant shifts in culture for the district, and I'll talk about that. Um, I ask that the board approve just the next two years as full calendars, um, but approve years three through five as draft calendars, and I recommend the board review them every January, because we're going to hear, you're going to hear from folks next year if things aren't working. So rather than one of the, I think the, the biggest feedback that I got not only from the board but from the community is why do we have to wait to change the calendar after that package was done? I think by building in a cycle every January, whether it's just if everything's going well, you just approve them and everything's good and we get it out to the community, but at least it provides you a stopgap if, if something um, changes dramatically. All right, so I'm going to give Mr. Suzo 30 seconds to less to get the calendars up. Now, next year is a fairly traditional calendar for Hopewell Valley, with the exception that it reduces uh, President's Weekend to one day in February. Um, we continue with the start of the school year. We start the Tuesday after Labor Day. Um, we start early. Labor Day is on the 2nd. Um, but going through this, um, we continue with the, the first full week of April. It lines up nicely with Good Friday. It's a nice long, if you want to make plans for a winter break, next year is the year to do it. It's a, the way that the holidays fall. Um, it's a long break. And this ends on June 18th. Um, so that was something we also wanted to do. Um, and make sure, as you knew, as I spoke previously, um, that you don't, we're trying to, the committee felt strongly, we don't want to go into that next week, if at all possible. Um, so this one is next year. Um, it's the final draft. It's been through the committee. We're pretty pleased with this. This is our recommendation moving forward. Not a significant departure other than uh, the building of uh, one snow day on the uh, Friday before Memorial Day. It does have a set um, end and it does reduce President's Weekend to one day. All of that enables us to bring down a, a calendar at the end on June 18th. Let me just keep going. Do you have any questions on this? Well, Let me. Oh, if go if I can ask just one sure. question. Yeah. Just to point out one thing. Mm -hmm. um, the latter part of the year, it looks like our staff development, the half days with staff development, are, are on. Wednesdays? Yes. I think traditionally they had been on Mondays. So yes. To explain the... Sure. So um, we're looking at, because one of the, the committee members was an educator and brought actually a, a spreadsheet that I think really uh, moved the committee, the number of days that if you had a class on a Monday, particularly on the elementary level, um, of sessions that you missed for PE and for other specials, it was significant. And she talked about um, trying to prepare students who are Monday in music. They were missing, um, do you remember the exact number of days? I don't have it with me, but six, six days less uh, throughout. The, oh, that's right. Well, there's committee members all over the place. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, so that's, that was the, the try to move it to the Wednesday, um, thinking that it would decrease that because all the other Half days are on the uh, um, all the many of the days off are on Mondays also. So that's a that is a change in culture though. So thank you for pointing that out, Adam. Okay, if we can go on to the following year, and I won't go through all these because it's um, they're on the website and you can check out the years three through five. I really want to go um, at least for the first two years because year two is a significant change um, with the goal of trying to end us early. That has us as a district coming back in September prior to Labor Day. Let me say that again. Coming back prior to Labor Day. Students would start on the 3rd and 4th. Ironically, it's the same days that they start next year, or, but because of the way Labor Day falls, it's starting, they're coming back before Labor Day. We get two days in 
um, before Labor Day. That enables us to end um, on June 17th. If we were not to do that, another change in this, and I'm going to draw your attention to, the committee departed from always making it the first day of um, spring break, always making it the first day of first week, full week of April, by changing it to the first week it kind of gets into April, with the understanding that it would overlap Good Friday um, with that. And then with that and coming back before Labor Day, we were still able to end on June 17th, which is another goal of the committee, again, to bring back um, as early as possible uh, at the end of the school year. Any questions about that one? I'll get the emails. Uh, all right, let's uh, just real quickly, if I can just highlight since our students are here. Um, year three. We recognize now Diwali in year three falls during the NJEA conference, but we do acknowledge it on the calendar. So schools are closed on November 4th, um, and we do, Tony, can you scroll down a little bit, I think in January, so I can hit. February 1st, we recognize Chinese New Year. Um, so, I, you know, it's, th we had a lot of discussion um, through this, but I really have to say that I think it really sends a clear message to our community of our openness and recognizing um, and, and being culturally responsive um, to that. And I have to really thank the students for, for their work on this, bringing this to our attention, because I think it's something that, that, um, that really s makes a good statement for us. Um, so uh, with that one, the committee, again, departed from the first week of April for spring break. Um, but with that brings us into um, June 21st. So we weren't able to bring it into the teens, but June 21st is pretty good compared to what we've experienced in the past. Um, and if we could just round out the last two. Now, so let me walk you through this one. Um, and this is, scroll up a little bit, Tony, so I can get to October. So that, so what we did in October was we moved the staff development day to Diwali. So schools are closed um, and staff has a staff development day on October 24th of the 2022. You guys will be in college. <laughs> it's, it's, um, but uh, so Diwali will, will be, the schools will be closed. Diwali will be recognized and um, it, during that year, Chinese New Year falls during the, um, during the uh, weekend. Um, Adam, is this the one with the yes. Yes. break? Yes. Yes. This one, and you can start sending the emails now. Um, but if you look at where we end in graduation, it's on the 15th. And one of the things we did talk about was trying to avoid Fridays for graduation. Um, just a concern about parties and, and things like that. Um, but the way that the winter break falls, uh, that January 1st is on a Sunday, so we would come back to school on January 2nd, the Monday. I can hear the grumbles, sorry. Um, and this again provides the board an opportunity, and so we'll just, we'll just skip past that. We'll finish up at, We'll finish up with 23-24. You guys will be married by this point, <laughs> uh, graduated college, and um, just fell over. Yeah, a, we recognize here, um, and 23-24, Diwali is recognized on November 1st. Uh, schools are closed. It's a staff development day for teachers. We have, um, our Chinese New Year is not on that one. So, um, so that is the, um, the way we're back to April being um, it, the um, first full week of April for spring break. And there we end on June 18th. Um, so again, my recommendation is uh, to be knowledgeable of years three through five going out to 23, 24. Um, I really want to commend the members of the committee and for sifting through 2,000 responses to our surveys and folks on the committee, they went down and they did word clouds of you know, highlights and people were highlighting you know, comments that people made. So they really did a, a thorough, thorough, thorough job 
Um, and I really want to thank them because I thought it was a collaborative effort to bring together. And that's why I think we were, we were on a roll, so we put out five calendars with the understanding that um, at least we have the first two. We can, if the board is comfortable with approving those and then uh, revisiting every, all the other calendars, all the legwork's done. You might just have to tweak certain things, um, but you have uh, five years of calendars in the hopper that you can, you can act on as we go forward. So the board will be asked to vote on those later in the night, but I just wanted to provide anybody, as I just reviewed those quickly, um, I can't provide that, but I believe the board wanted to provide the community opportunity to comment on the, any of the calendars or any comments, I think. Do any board members want to comment or have any yeah, questions? I think that the students need special recognition. <laughs> you know, because I mean, look. I mean, how often do we see these big changes? Um, and this need, this needs to happen. I mean, we are we're an amazing district, and this just goes to show you that um, you know we foster amazing students like like these gentlemen um, and their support that help promote this. And this is what I mean. This we need this. So. Thank you. <laughs> We'll ask you to come back in 23, 24 when we have our next round. I was actually going to ask them to come and help us work on the budget. <laughs> your presentation was like ridiculous. It was really impressive. You are the light that we celebrate. Really? I'm sitting right here. My budget presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm yeah. really impressed. <laughs> were you be that good when you were there? Uh, no. <laughs> but I'm going to bring him back for the budget presentation. <laughs> So, members of the public are invited to address the board on any matter for a maximum of three minutes during this portion of the meeting. You're asked to state your name, address, and municipality. In response to your comments, the Board of Education may respond or direct the superintendent to do so. The board may also opt to take the matter up at a future meeting so that the matter is researched by the district administration. Public comment is now open. Do you have some slides for us? <laughs> at this time. Um, thank you, Ms. Murray. Thank you, Dr. Smith, Dr. Treese, Mr. Suzo, and board members. Um, I'd like to thank the administration and the Board of Education for hopefully passing this historic amendment to our district's calendar and giving us a platform to speak our minds. Additionally, we sincerely appreciate the support we received from the community uh, through our petition, which received over 500 signatures. Your voices have been heard, and hopefully we've made history here in Hopewell Valley. This change to our district's calendar depicts a future of religious and cultural equality in Hopewell Valley. However, progress cannot and will not stop here. No individual should ever have to compromise or sacrifice a part of their identity in order to feel more accepted in school. This community will not rest until every student, no matter their ethnicity, religion, gender, or sexual identity, is included in the culture of Hopewell Valley. While we should all be proud of this cultural milestone in our, in our school district, we should also recognize the hundreds of unheard voices in our community. Only together can we achieve true freedom, equality, and prosperity. Thank you all, and remember, progress is not, ev is not inevitable. It's up to us to create it. Thank you. Just put your name. Don't run away yet. Your name and address, just so you're preserved for, for <laughs> everywhere. Drew Capadia, 147 Valmore Court, Pennington, New Jersey. Thank you so much, Mr. Kapadia, for everything that you have presented to us and for that awesome speech. <laughs> anyone else? I know nobody wants to follow that, right? I don't even want to follow that. <laughs> Does anyone else like, would anyone else like to speak about anything? Okay, seeing none, public comment is now closed. Um, old business. Any items of old business that we need to address? Seeing none. Uh, may I have a motion, please, for the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. Motion carries. Mr. DiDonato, you're not finished yet. Finance and facilities, my friend. <laughs> I do have one thing to move, and that is a change order, and it's actually a removal of some funds. Uh, it's 
a credit towards some unused um, uh, expenditures relating to a court or renovation at the, the, at the high school. So I would like a motion to move the change order in the amount of $2,620. Thank you. Um, so we met in the finance committee today, and primarily it was the entire board open to the public. And uh, you know, we just went over some you know, various scenarios and discussions uh, part of the budget. Uh, you know, conversation is the best we can do with each other and understand each other. Um, so I think. Um, productive once again and uh, I, I anticipate year over year we're just going to continue to get better at it so mm -hmm. um, that's really it that's all I have. Thank you Mr. DiDonato. So all those in favor of the um, change order acceptance? Aye. 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 Opposed abstained? Motion carries. Personnel. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to move the personnel committee agenda. Second. Alrighty. Um, you'll notice there are several teachers on the agenda this evening that um, I'd like to formally recognize and congratulate on their retirement. Uh, Carl Weidman, Lori DiGatano, Kathleen Belton, and Lorinda Swenson. Um, these individuals uh, with our other retirees are gonna be formally recognized actually at our board meeting on May 20th. Um, we also reviewed in our meeting the violence vandalism report, which Mr. Suzo uh, presented to the public earlier to this evening. And lastly, uh, we debriefed on the recent CJ Pride job fair that took place on Thursday, March 14th. Uh, CJ Pride is the Central Jersey program for the recruitment of diverse educators. There were over 900 candidates that attended the job fair and there were 24 districts represented, which is quite impressive because Tony, last year was how many? Yeah, we had about 250. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. amazing. And that's all I have. Tony, thank you. There was one more thing I just wanted to add. It's also on the agenda. I just want to acknowledge um, Sue Nissenblatt student assistance counselor. Um, I know it's on the agenda, it's a resignation, but it really is a retirement. She just doesn't have enough years in the public setting to call it a retirement. But I had the privilege and the honor of hiring Sue when I was the building principal at Timberlane, and she's done some amazing work. She's been with us since 2011, has done some incredible programming for our kids and for our community, a lot, a lot of parent workshops. So I just wanted to take a moment publicly to recognize her for all of her hard work. Ms. Linthorst? Yes. Ms. Pallara? Yes. Mr. Swicky? Yes. Ms. Tracy? Yes. Ms. O'Reilly? Yes. Mr. DiDonato? Yes. Ms. Murray? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Ed Program. Ms. Pallara. Thank you. I'd like a motion to move the Ed Committee agenda. Second. Great. Um, I don't think we have it. Everything's on consent. Everything's yeah. on consent. Everything's on consent. Okay, so I don't have to move anything. Perfect. Right. I just need to talk. I just need to talk. Um, <laughs> so today's Ed Committee meeting was um, one of the most interesting, I think, that I have been a part of since um, being on the board. And the high school administration came in to really talk us through class sizes and course selection and how scheduling and how our values of helping every student find their passion all aligned, but then gets us to some of the budget challenges that we um, are experiencing now. So it was a really productive <laughs> conversation, and I feel as though it's just the beginning of the conversation, and this will be ongoing, and it will be done in a very thoughtful and um, <coughs> collaborative way to make sure that we are meet, continuing to meet the needs of the students and families of the community, but that was a, a they did a phenomenal job explaining it, and, and I really valued everyone's um, input on, on the committee as we went through this, so thank you. And then um, 
Also, uh, David Sherwin came in, who's the new supervisor for K-12 uh, of language arts, and he did a wonderful presentation about really bringing in equity into the, the classrooms around language and literature, and talked about some of his plans, so there'll be some exciting things to come um, within all of our classrooms. And one piece that I'm very excited about is it sounds like there's going to be a great read, a great big read, is that what it's called? A big read, um, where everyone in the school community is reading the same book, and it's, I don't want to give anything away, but it's more to come on that. So. Uh, very productive meeting. It's a Dr. Seuss book. No. Sorry. <laughs> it's my level. <laughs> okay. Um, policy. Okay. So, so, okay. Got people still waiting around. So we'll get through the new policies quickly. All right. For first reading, we have uh, policy and regulation 7100, long range facility planning. These mainly uh, relate to uh, what we have to do uh, in terms of defining and uh, substantiating our long-range facility plans. And we're, uh, we have to do that every five years. And the, the changes here are primarily driven by uh, new state regulations. So, so uh, policy has discussed this, and we are recommending it for, um, for first reading. So I ask for a motion to, uh, to move uh, policy and regulation 7100. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstained? Motion Aye. carries. Okay, for second reading, uh, we have um, uh, policy and regulation 7441, electronic surveillance in school buildings and on school grounds. Uh, we have uh, policy and regulation 9150 for school visitors and regulation 9161 for crowd control. And uh, at least in terms of school visitors and crowd control, these were more or less putting into policy and regulation some of our existing practices that have evolved over the last couple of years. Uh, and in terms of electronic surveillance, it was not so much us defining uh, that we're going to be using those devices as to the restrictions on observation of uh, you know, surveillance that, that's taken, making sure uh, we limit when and who needs to, to review that. So uh, policy has reviewed these, and uh, we were recommending uh, their approval. There are no changes since first reading. So uh, if I could get a motion to uh, move these policies and regulations. So Second. We have a roll call, please. Ms. Pallara? Yes. Mr. Swicky? Yes. Ms. Tracy? Yes. Ms. O'Reilly? Yes. Mr. DiDonato? Yes. Ms. Linthorst? Yes. Ms. Murray? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, and then they're listed as separate, but how should we do it? Is it okay to just move them as one unit in terms yeah, of so. the direct? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what I'd ask for is a motion to move uh, first uh, our, I guess, confirmation on the first two years district calendars, 2019 and 20, as well as our draft calendars through 23-24. Can I get a uh, motion, please? To moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstained? Good. Motion carries. Good. <laughs> Simple as that. I would like to th also thank the members of the calendar committee who were here that spent hours um, reviewing the and discussing the calendar. So thank you for all of your time and much appreciated. We have policy uh, on April 8th in the morning. Yeah. 8.30? Yep, 8.30. Bye. Yep. So we're going to do that before the program. Oh, it's already there. Yep. 
Nein. Anyone note anything that needs to be changed, added, subtracted? The we're gonna are we doing a longer finance in April? We have the work session. We're gonna the work session. Okay. I guess it's gonna be budget and then other other yeah, stuff. Yeah, sounds good. <coughs> if we need one after that, we can we can extend the fifteenth. Well, we can we can always if we need another date beyond another work session. Okay. Decide that on. So, all those in favor to accept the calendar? We, we need a motion. Oh, we need a motion. <coughs> so, move. Thank Second. You. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstained. Motion carries. Any items of new business? Okay. We're back to uh, public comments. <coughs> Members of the public are invited to address the board on any matter for a maximum of three minutes during this portion of the meeting. You're asked to state your name, address, and municipality. In response to your comments, the Board of Education may respond or direct the superintendent to do so. The board may also opt to take the matter up at a future meeting, so the matter is researched by district administration. Public comment is open. Seeing none, public comment is now closed. Okay, may I have a motion, please, for us to go into executive session. We will be um, discussing harassment and intimidation and bullying matters, um, special education legal matter, and potential litigation. And also student oh, student matter, yes, sorry. Student and matter. a student matter um, action. Uh, no action is taken on. There might be action. Um, no, there's no action on the special ed one. No, so there's no. No action will be taken. Um, so may I have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed abstained? Motion carries. All right. Thank you, public.